It is Saturday, October the 12th, 2019. This is the Distant Peasant Podcast, and I am your host, Jeff in Georgia. On today's show, The Peasant's Revolt. Yeah, that's right. The one that was so big, they just call it The Peasant's Revolt. The peasant revolts are numerous throughout history. We're talking about the good old one in jolly old England. The 14th century, we'll get the fire built and lit. Next week, we'll watch it burn. But of course, before I get to all of that, just a brief reminder that these shows are brought to you by listeners like you, folks who go to patreon.com slash distant peasant. They become recurring donors for as little as one dollar a month. Thank you to each and every one of my patrons. There is a PayPal link, paypal.me slash distant peasant, which you can find at distantpeasant.com. When people put money in there, it's really great. I love seeing it. And then spending it on things that I need. Please and thank you. On with the show. So, the Peasants' Revolt. Why have I not discussed any literal peasant revolts up to this point? I think that's a fair question. And there are lots of good answers. For one thing, peasant revolts during the age of European feudalism, which is more or less what I'll be restricting myself to today, were incredibly common. In Europe, at least, they were almost always inevitably crushed before achieving their even limited aims let alone achieving any lasting gains, but in any case, they failed to fundamentally transform feudal society over and over again into a more socialized and equal form. Though lefties worldwide should all be pretty familiar with that feeling. In many of these peasants' cases, though, their aims and ideas were limited. Even were they allowed to succeed more often, these revolts were not usually channels of revolution or even progressive reform. In nearly all cases. Another reason is because of the nature of the historical material of the time. You see, mass literacy and the adoption of the printing press are a long ways off from the events of today. Meaning that in ancient times, vast, vast majority of written material left to us is written by the ruling class for the ruling class. Peasants themselves didn't spend a great deal of time chronicling their revolts in their cases, probably because hardly any of them could read or write more than a little. And what this means is that all of the information that comes to us comes from biased sources, authors who do little to conceal the contempt with which they see the peasants. And this bias can result in exaggerations both sincere and deceptive, lies told both in earnest and inadvertently. It can be tough to cobble together enough reliable information to give the small folk a fair shake in adventures such as these in the Peasant's Revolt 1381, and I humbly admit to you that to the extent I am a historian of any kind, I am not a European or British or medieval one. But even I'm a bit better than the primary sources of the day, I'd say who in addition to their biases against the vast majority of people who lived in their world, also wrote in a time before history as an academic discipline was really a thing. There's one more reason I haven't tackled any peasant revolts. It's a little darker. Now, I will cop to the label of socialist, but it's only fair to point out that the relationship of socialists, Marxists, communists, the left generally to peasants of historical and contemporary times, it's all a bit mixed. There's always been a great amount of disagreement among and within these factions on what precisely is the role for this mass of greatly exploited people working in agricultural labor and building a more socialist society. Can they lead? Must they be led? Are their aims in line with that socialist vision or must they be educated and uplifted? Perhaps even controlled? Do they have a revolutionary socialist vision or merely a communal one? And to what degree and in what manners, if any, do those at the bottom of today's societies have in common with the historical peasant? 
Fear this sounds paternalistic or high-handed, complicated, naive, authoritarian, or if me implying that it does indeed sound that way elicits a negative reaction from you, welcome to the party. Anyway, all that being said, turns out I've decided there is at least one peasant revolt worth discussing in detail. It pokes at these questions a little bit. Though I hasten to add that if you're looking for some hack podcaster like me to chop through over a century of disagreements over the correct and orthodox conclusions to draw from events like this as a socialist in these times, you're going to be disappointed. Of course, I certainly won't shy away from letting you know where I land, even if I laden it with on the other hands. But hopefully it will give you some things to ponder about. We will see if medieval era peasants in England with their bad teeth, dirt floors, superstitions and prejudices, but also their suffering and courage have any wisdom to bequeath to us. So let's dive in to the Peasants' Revolt 1381 right in the heart, jolly old England. So life in 14th century England. Now, I just want to dispense with one fact without getting too bogged down in the specifics. The vast, vast majority of people in England, and indeed throughout most of Europe, worked in a single industry, agriculture. That is, they grew food, raised animals, they planted, reaped, sowed, processed, sold farm products, kept the farm going. Wheat, barley, oats, these are the most common crops. But most farms in England also had a small house garden for vegetables like cabbages, onions, peas, beans, maybe a small fruit tree or two. They may keep a couple pigs, a flock of geese, more fortunate of them a cow or an ox maybe for plowing. Horses were for only the luckiest, were far more likely to be owned by knights, merchants, aristocrats, yeomen, at the very least. Most families don't have enough animals to effectively utilize manure for fertilizer. So for this and other reasons, agricultural productivity is more or less the same as it was a thousand years ago under the Roman Empire in Europe. There was a time when if you died before you reached the age of 60, the Lord took your best beast and the church your second best to compensate them for the military service and tithes you would have delivered unto them, respectively, had you had the good sense to live. Hardly any Peasant family had more than two working beasts in the first place. It was all a very hard, scrabble existence. A single fire, one bad drought, heavy rains could mean the difference between having enough to live and not. And this is still the case for a huge percentage of the world's global population, in fact. But don't worry, we ain't gonna go through no farm laborers' day. In addition to the more mundane challenges of such an existence, there's a couple more singular causes affecting jolly old England in the 14th century we need to talk about. Now, politically, England's kind of a mess to describe, a tangle of dukes, counts, and nobles, marriage alliances, knights fighting for glory or gold or God, laws that contradict one another, a monarch atop the whole thing who is both divinely powerful and incredibly constrained by the, both the world and the people around him. There's a parliament, but even its lower so-called House of Commons is packed with only the wealthiest and most noble. Anglicanism is still a long, long ways off. This is a Catholic country still. And this is also the century when we get our first ballads of Robin Hood, a rough country outlaw and highwayman who rewards honesty and punishes deception. Now later he will get gentrified and a maid Marian will be written up for him. But for now, he's just a crack archer, a thug with a heart of gold, a medieval Han Solo. Anyway, the system was a complicated way of working out the practical effects of a simple answer to a simple question. Whose land is this? It's the king's. Everything in England is the king's. Every inch of land, from the farmer's shacks to the massive castles, it's all the king's. Everyone else just held title in his name and by his grace. Your descendants inherited because he allowed it, and sometimes he took a cut or charged a fee. Want to move to the next village over to work? The king must agree. Do you want to move to the city and learn a trade? You must have the king's leave. 
Do you need your farm equipment improved or repaired? Do you have grain that needs milling? The King's Forge, the King's Mill, or over there? Now I'm oversimplifying a bit, and in practice it was the King's vassals who administered much of these privileges and obligations for the peasants, and then sent the money up the chain, but basically that's how it was. The King owns England. Much of what people highborn and low thought of what was just or right, the way things ought to be, was colored by this fact. Robin Hood was literally trespassing, by the way, living in the king's forest without his leave. That was his first and most fundamental crime. Of course, in addition to being an outlaw, Robin Hood is supposedly a fine archer. What was up with that? Well... Once upon a time, from 1272 to 1307, if you're picky, there was a king of England called Edward I, Malleus Scotorum, Hammer of the Scots. He wasn't the first, but he got super into the longbow, as it helped him win a bunch of battles in the Isles and on the continent. More about those continental wars specifically soon. Probably first getting popular with the Welsh before the English, the longbow, which for the record was anywhere from about 4 to 6 feet long, or between 1.2 and 1.8 meters, became an important element of society in England far beyond its place on the battlefield. An entire culture grew up around it, and even though a longbow took months or even years to make it, at least as the wood was dried and nurtured and shaped was still far less expensive and far easier to produce than a huge knightly suit of armor, or even all the metal required to forge a sword. Exactly the sort of opposing forces a large number of trained longbowmen could and did absolutely destroy. If you train them up, you can volley lethally from a couple football fields away if you have a mass of longbowmen, and between 70 and 80 yards, even a few longbowmen could take out several infantry or even cavalry each with arrows that would shred even the best armor available at the time. Your average longbowman could probably loose about 10 aimed shots a minute, your cream of the crop about double that number. But the biggest downside to that is, well, it just wasn't easy. Proficiency with a longbow required literally years to achieve. And at a time when soldiering was often a part-time gig, the skills and muscle power necessary to wield a longbow effectively in war atrophy pretty quickly. Because of this, archery contests during times of peace were numerous and popular in England. Laws were passed and enforced requiring every village to train up some longbowmen. For England, God, and the King. And for a time on Sundays, all sport, except archery, was forbidden. The English made so many damn longbows, they actually started to run out of yew trees in England. And the English won't really give up the longbow until gunpowder starts catching on centuries later. So what are we going to do with all these longbowmen anyway? Well, in addition to fighting in Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, the United Kingdom not being a thing yet, they were being used to fight in a series of conflicts historians usually just call the Hundred Years' War. From about 1337 to 1453, or in other words, several generations on both sides of the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, the kings and nobles of France and England fought a series of battles over the crown, income, and lands of France, and keeping the wool trade between the continent and England going. It was more or less just a big, destructive, pointless family feud between the House of Plantagenet and the House of Vola that went on for years fought almost entirely on the continent, and the details of this are almost entirely insignificant to us here today, because this is not a military history show. But a reasonable question to ask is, if war was so destructive and wasteful, in addition to all the terrible things war is, why did the English government keep the thing up for so long? And the reason is because it was actually pretty profitable while they were winning with those longbowmen. And they did that quite epically from time to time, racking up huge ransoms. But on the whole, all the longbowmen in the world couldn't overcome fighting a war of aggression in foreign territory, becoming increasingly reliant on mercenaries with hard specie needed as payment, domestic unrest, 
and disaster. Speaking of disaster, there's one more thing that needs touching on before we get into the politics. This event most people are passingly familiar with. The Bane of Justinian, the Blue Sickness, La Pest, the Great Mortality, Mors Nigra. These days, we've all more or less settled on the name, the Black Death. From about 1347 to 1351, a series of pandemics erupted rolling west from Asia to Europe along trade routes and just doing a shitload of killing. Estimates regarding exactly how much killing it did vary widely upon the scholarship and region in question, but the population of Eurasia was reduced by about either 30% on the low end and 60% on the higher. And entire lifetimes could be and have been devoted to telling the story of the Black Death's causes and effects on art, history, politics, culture, religion, and philosophy, biology, medicine, more, more, more. But for us in poor old England, the plague arrived in 1348. And though it was once widely accepted that England fared much better than Eurasia as a whole, and population loss estimates around 15% were common in the early 20th century, more recent evidence suggests comparable mortality rates to the continent as a whole, something like 40 to 60%. Now, the rich were not safe, of course, and no one at the time ever figured out how the disease was spread. Fleas in the rats! or how to treat it effectively, really. Antibiotics, quick. But in England, at least, it seems it had only a few victims in the ruling class. Of the royal family, only a single member who was in France when she caught sick is sure to have died from bubonic plague. Priests and clergy, however, were less protected, as they often had close and regular contact with the victims. But as in nearly all things, the worst hit victims were the poorest of England. 90% of the population at this time lived in the countryside and had nowhere to escape to. And if they were lucky enough to live, usually nothing to eat afterwards. Famine nearly always follows plague, for the record. Now, amazingly, the world did not end, though certainly many people at the time thought it might. So it took about 500 grueling days for the Black Death to make its way across the Isles. By 1350, the stunned survivors, most of whom had lost many family and friends, some of whom everyone they had ever known, were left to pick up the pieces. I hesitate to use the phrase silver lining, but there were some consequences for all of this that weren't all bad after the immediate dangers of plague and famine had passed for the little people. Though I should tell you, the plague will be back, both here and in Europe. It will usually recur every 5 to 12 years, until the 17th century. Anyway, one of those silver linings is the bargaining power of the remaining workers. You see, labor shortages began to rise bad, as the noble class began to demand traditional amounts of labor without the traditional labor pool. As a result, at a time when records were rare and easily destroyed or manipulated, there is no real police force and demand for your labor extremely high, whole families would ditch their lords, find a way to drop off the rolls for a better chance at a life with the lord two manners over. People whose ancient villages were basically gone, and whose families had scattered or were left dead, would drift without leave to the cities to hopefully learn to practice a trade. Those left behind often got the land that was abandoned and adjacent added to their own plots. And in, that meant that if they could keep it all going, their fortunes actually improved. Now, prices generally rose faster than wages, which meant shortages for basic necessities for a great many people, yes. But there's also even less incentive to be satisfied with toiling under backward feudal obligations as sure a path to destitution and perhaps death by starvation as any other. We actually know, based on the history, that rising standards of living did happen at the time for at least some of these peasants and yeomen. As class-based sumptuary laws began appearing, forbidding those of lower birth from wearing certain fine clothes, for example. The crown even tried to decree both that everyone must work and that they must work for the same wage they got 10 years ago, that it be illegal to send your children to school rather than work, 
And they issued punishments like branding and burning for lying about prelates, dukes, earls, barons, and other nobles and great men of the realm. As one old prick at the time put it, translated into modernish English, of course, quote, three things, all of the same sort, are merciless when they get the upper hand. A water flood, a wasting fire, and the common multitude of small folk. For these will never be checked by reason or discipline, and therefore, to speak in brief, the present world is so troubled by them that it is well to set a remedy thereunto. Ha! Age of ours, whither turnest thou? End quote. Whither indeed? So, to sum up, in the years leading up to the Peasants' Revolt, the endless warfare of several generations of English kings were taking their toll upon the wealth of the country. The Black Death has killed about half of the kingdom, and the church is an elitist institution, little different from the non-religious nobles who truly control the country. The church's prestige fell much in the wake of the plague, as they had preached that the pestilence was punishment for the sin of man, and yet their priests ravaged as badly by the death as anyone else. The people had far less faith in their church to deliver them from their earthly miseries than they had in the past, even if their Christian faith was, if anything, increased. For years now, the crown has been attempting to shift the burden of funding the king's military adventures from the barons onto the less wealthy through poll taxes. Basically, this is a head tax. Every head owes this much money, with some exemptions for married couples, those under 14, stuff like that. Now, that might sound pretty good, but it's not like the king's men were just going to take your word for it. They would instead measure pubic hair and perform crude virginity tests. As you can imagine, all this was massively unpopular, <laughs> though the early rounds of taxes and harassment seemed to have raised a decent amount of money before widespread evasion began and continued for years. Then in June 1381, two men, one in Essex to London's northeast-ish and one in Kent to London's southeast-ish, separated by the River Thames, both pushed their luck. And before you know it, there's a huge army marching on London, demanding the end of feudalism. Thomas Bampton was the king's man, a member of parliament, a justice of the peace, and he was in Brentwood to figure out why these people weren't paying their taxes. The men of the little village of nearby Fobbing in Essex, where they were spoken for by a baker, also named Thomas, told Mr. Bampton that basically, see, these people have given all they can, and you won't be getting any more out of them. That's the way it is. Well, you can't speak to a man of the king like that as a fucking bread maker, so, men, arrest him. Well, in the parlance of our times, Brampton had failed to tactically ascertain the potential scenario possibilities during kinetic action. That is, he really misread the room. You see, instead of doing any arresting himself in his small band, they were more or less arrested themselves when 20 longbowmen appeared outside his little court and very energetically encouraged them to get the fuck out of town. And they did so. And then they went and wind off to a man named Robert Belknap. That was Sir Robert Belknap to you, as far as he was concerned. Now, Mr. Belknap rolled back into town yammering about how he was the chief justice of the Court of Common Pleas, and how these men who had attacked his buddy were rebels against the crown, began demanding jurors assemble for a quick trial and some hanging. He found a couple unlucky participants, began setting up a little court, and suddenly there were a hundred men with longbows standing around. Now, Belknap will survive this day, tied wrong way round to his horse and chased out of town. It was only after someone got him down that he saw another horse following his path away from the village. The severed heads of his jurors were attached to it. At more or less the same time, down in Kent, another big wig named Simon de Burley, and yes, that was Sir Simon de Burley to you, wanted his serf back. 
two subordinates were sent to fetch a man named Robert Belling, who insisted that he was not the serf of Simon de Burley, but hey, you two seem nice. I mean, you're just doing your job. How about you take this sum of money and we just agree to drop all this? Maybe a bribe, but the legal kind, frankly. A settlement rather than a lawsuit. Well, they said no. And then they hauled his ass away to some dank hole in Rochester Castle. Now, it took a day or so, but in that time, a group of very angry and very armed peasants stormed the jail, and the constable let Mr. Belling go, lest he be shot full of arrows or his head separated from his body. In fact, all the prisoners in the jail were set free, including one who was already infamous at the time, destined to become one of the chief leaders of the revolt, the priest John Ball. Because when the law is evil, criminality is a virtue. And the reason John Ball was locked up wasn't because he liked to lie or steal, but because he spoke out against the lies and the theft of his mother church. Now, we know little details of John Ball's life and little of what he said. A few letters written cryptically by him survive. There are some oral traditions about him. But the reportage of the chronicling folk at the time universally hated his ass, and his memory and record were systematically suppressed and destroyed in the years after the revolt. We do know that soon after he was let out, he gave a barn burner of a sermon to the Kent-based faction of our heroes that in today's English might have contained words gone something like this, quote, Good people. Things cannot go right in England and never will until goods are held in common and there are no more villains and gentlefolk, but we are all one and the same. In what way are those whom we call lords greater masters than ourselves? How have they deserved it? Why do they hold us in bondage? If we all spring from a single father and mother, Adam and Eve, how can they claim or prove that they are lords more than us? except by making us produce and grow wealth, which they spend. When Adam delved and Eve spanned, who then was the gentle man? End quote. Along with John Ball, a man named Watt Tyler, so important the whole event is sometimes just called Watt Tyler's Rebellion, emerged as another important leader, probably via election. For the same reasons as John Ball's reasons, we know little about him for sure. His given name may have been Walter. He may have had a daughter who was indecently handled by a king's taxman and whom he killed in retaliation. He was probably from Essex or Kent. He probably tiled the roofs of buildings for a living. And that's about it for his life before the revolt. History is often told and conceived of as a series of kings or presidential administrations or imperial dynasties, even today. And it was even worse back then. No one was in the habit of recording what was happening gave two shits about who these guys were or what they'd been through. So if you consider all that, what little we do know about them is actually to their great credit, I think. Since you have to make a pretty big splash if you're a little person to make the Blue Bloods in 14th century England notice you even if they only notice you with contempt. So, before I conclude here for now, it is reasonable to wonder if there are thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, of mass and armed peasants assembling and getting ready to march on London with purpose, all in the space of a few days, complete with thousands of trained and deadly longbowmen, could this really have been based on a couple of isolated but spontaneous incidents by some dick cops? Well, no. At least probably not. And hopefully you can tell that from my prelude. Longbows weren't easy to come by or easy to wield, so a bunch of trained longbowmen appearing on the scene isn't just a thing that happens, for one thing. And for another thing, that Hundred Years' War, which we're about halfway through, it was not going well at this time, and was very, very expensive. And the Black Death had both shattered people's faith in the church and massively shifted the labor market. Finally, in the years leading up to this outbreak, we have evidence today that there was a growing movement in at least these two counties 
by serfs to organize and refuse to perform their legally obligated unpaid labor. Tax strikes and just regular strikes were common. The peasants even had the gall to try and challenge their obligations through courts of law. And village elites increasingly refused to take up positions as local officials and risk getting caught up in the enforcement of increasingly onerous taxes and obligations. In fact, we know for sure that at this time the rebels sent many, many letters, usually in code or metaphor. And at a time when the literacy rate is so low, this all really points to evidence that in fact, these peasants had allies in the yeoman and merchant classes, that they were coordinated both tactically and strategically, and that this was planned. These were not dumb country rustics sparked by charismatic leadership in the heat of the moment, little better than the beasts of the countryside, ready to ransack the wealth of England's ruling class. No, these people had leadership with both the credibility of reputation, election, and God. Practical demands for their government beyond just the heads of their enemies. And a plan. This bunch of carpenters, sawyers, masons, tailors, weavers, glovers, literal butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, would force the king to hear them out. And not only will he hear them out, he'll agree to every one of their demands. But all that will have to wait till next time. Ha ha! See? I hope I hooked you. Sorry if there was too much prelude, but really wanted to do a thorough job because uh, I, don't know, I give a shit about this. So uh, if you appreciate that, you can go to patreon.com slash distant peasant, paypal.me slash distant peasant. You can become a contributor to this fine project, please and thank you. Part two will not take as long as part one did. I already have a fair amount of idea about where I want to go and what I want to write. Look out for that. See you.